All right, folks. Well, um, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here. And I kind of, uh, when you all reached out to me, I sort of jumped at the chance to, uh, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is basically building amateur radio through amateur radio clubs and local groups. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently president of the Nashua Area Radio Society, which um, is a basically rebuilding story. Um, back, I would say six years ago, this club almost went out of existence. And uh, what we did is we dedicated ourselves to mentoring, growing amateur radio, helping hams develop new skills. And the, the response that we've been able to, uh, that we've been, I guess, gifted to receive has been just tremendous. So what I'm hoping to do is spend 15 or 20 minutes tonight and uh, just give you a feel of some of the things that we did, as well as a little bit of a preview of work we're doing to kind of expand the impact of some of these things across the entire region here in New England. So just a little bit of history and let me see if I, can you all see this okay? Is it working no for you? Yep, okay. No problem. So just a little bit of a starting point. 2015, we had 35 members. We, it probably less than 25 of them were really still paying dues and active. We got 10 at a meeting, we were having a good night um, and we were pretty much in decline with field day being the only major activity. As a matter of fact, my predecessor had to cancel a field day because he couldn't get enough people to do it. Today, as I speak with you, we've grown to 430 members. We have about 50 or 60 at our meetings. About 60% of the club is licensed less than five years. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we got there. Um, some great engagement with young people on around STEM learning in schools. And uh, field day is important, but we've added a ton of new stuff. So, um, and, uh, you know, folks often ask me, you know, how did you do this? And if I were to sum it up in one thing, it's that we decided to make our group about bringing new people into amateur radio, mentoring to get them on the air and build their skills, and, uh, and then helping them have, as well as the experienced hams in our group, many of which who have joined us, have a tremendous experience with amateur radio. We're also very diverse. Um, we're involved, um, and I'm actually personally involved in, in almost not every aspect, but many aspects of amateur radio. And we built our club around the notion that you really have to embrace um, all the good things that amateur radio brings and create an environment that nurtures all of that stuff if you wanna truly be successful um, in a group like an amateur radio club. Um, you can see what our mission here is. Um, we also, in the process, formed a 501c3 nonprofit and have raised a lot of money to support the program, some of which I'm going to tell you about tonight. And uh, one of the things that helped us a lot is that we restructured our leadership team to include the kinds of people we were hoping to reach. So my first board as president um, back in 2016 um, was a seven-person board, and four of the members were licensed less than a year. Um, we also had a, uh, um, a then 14-year-old youth advisor. Actually, she was probably about 12 at that point. She's 14 now. And um, um, that leadership team, all of the help that we got collaboratively made all the difference in the world for amateur radio in, in our club and in our area. Okay. Um, a couple things that really helped. Um, we, we focused a lot early on on building a modern brand. We, we have a very well-developed website. There's no two days that go by where someone in our group doesn't provide uh, an article or some sort of content that makes the website fresh. There's a tremendous focusing on mentoring on this website. We, we have a, a place where folks can go and ask a question and there's not a day will go by that two or three people won't jump in and collaboratively help that person figure out what they're trying to do. We also very heavily leverage Facebook and Twitter and social media. I think the last time I looked, our Facebook page for our group had over a thousand followers. Um, and uh, all of this has helped us um, basically get the word out on our programs and get people engaged in them 
at a very high level of act, interest and activity. Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense, we grow by about two to three new members a week at this point, and we really don't do anything to actively recruit those people. They simply come to us because they find out about our programs and the work we're trying to do to help hams everywhere. And, uh, and um, you know, they, they want to be part of that. One of the very first things we did, and I'm, I'm a very big advocate for the importance of this as a key role that amateur radio clubs can play, is we put a big focus on licensing new people and helping existing hams upgrade their licenses. Now, at this stage, we teach between seven and eight licensed classes a year. We teach all three levels, tech, general, and extra every spring and every fall. And we usually do one to two additional classes that are focused on specific groups of, of high school or middle school students and their teachers. Um, our classes are, include lots of hands-on activities and demos and so on that are designed to not only encourage people to get licensed, but to get use their licenses and get involved in, in using amateur radio and having fun with it and learning. Um, our instructors are all people, for the most part, who have been through our amateur radio class. You can see Abby at the bottom there, AB1BY teaching. She earned her extra class license with us on her 13th birthday. And she's a huge advocate for our licensing work and for young people in general. Um, this has been a very successful program. We've licensed or upgraded over 360 people successfully. And that's all levels of licenses in the last six years. Our success rate in this process for all levels and all ages, including extra and school students is over 92%. Um, another program that's been very successful um, and I think is an important part of, of what we need to be doing as an amateur radio service is um, what I'll call a modern form of mentoring or Elmering. We have a program called Tech Night. This is uh, actually a second uh, a one to two hour session we do every month here where we take a topic from the very basic in amateur radio all the way up to uh, including very advanced stuff like um, satellite stations, moon bounce stations, surface mount soldering, uh, circuit design. I mean, we've really covered the whole gamut. And the way we came up with this program is we had all of our members brainstorm up the things that they thought would be interesting and then we put a survey out to all of the folks that were interested in these programs and let them prioritize what they wanted to do first. And through that kind of collaborative process that involved everybody, we came up with a very successful program we call Tech Night. It's very hands-on. You can see at the bottom, for example, one of our members is uh, demonstrating uh, how a Yagi works. He built a, a two meter, he calls it a Lego Yagi, where he can put individual elements on um, and transmit through it. And then he has a dipole with a light bulb on it where you can actually visualize the pattern that he's creating with his Lego antenna as a way to learn about how this stuff works. Now, one of the things I really wanna stress here is we did not have a lot of money or a lot of resources and we really didn't need that to do these things. What it was really about is working collaboratively with all of the hams around us, uh, many of which who we helped along the way to create these programs and deliver them. So, you know, if you're, if you're might be thinking, well, gee, some of this stuff looks like it could be fun or a good idea, but do we have the resources? As long as you have hams who are expert or knowledgeable on things that other hams want to learn about, you probably pretty much have everything you need. And the, your challenge is to work collaboratively with folks to inspire them to help. Um, we've had some great success with young people. Um, the ARL has some wonderful programs that are, are fun for young people to get started in amateur radio. Two that we've been really active in are ARL Kids Day and the ARL Rookie Roundup. Um, Abby, who's that 13-year-old extra who's been so helpful, actually, she personally got involved um, with her dad participating in ARL Kids Day. So she's one of our biggest advocates for that program. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of folks in our area. We have a strong contest community here in New England and contesters, I think many cases are looking for ways to get new people started. I'll talk about another way to do that for a little bit more advanced hymns in a minute, but for young people, there's nothing like the ARL Rookie Roundup. 
This is also a great way for a new ham, sometimes even a tech, if you're willing to operate as a control operator and help them to get involved in contesting and, and compete successfully. One of the coolest things that we've experienced here is watching a group of young hams sit and try to learn and process the Aero Rookie Roundup CW. And the way they do it is they usually, none of them really know CW, but they all sit there at a group and work together and listen to the calls over and over until they figure it out. And they kind of work collaboratively and in the process practice CW and, uh, and do well in a contest. So I have a quick video here, I think will warm your heart a bit of, um, of uh, an Aero Rookie Roundup that we did a while ago from my station. QRZ, November 1, Foxtrot Delta. Could the Kilo Echo Zero station come again? QSL, Kilo Echo Zero, Foxtrot, Mexico X ray. This is November 1, Foxtrot Delta. My name is Abby, Alpha Bravo Bravo Yankee, uh, 16 November Hotel. Could I get your name, your license, and state, please? So I think you can see that if you open your station to new hams or young people, you can create a tremendous experience in, in, for them, um, have them have a lot of fun, get introduced to a really fun and kind of important part for us to support, which is the contesting community in amateur radio. And uh, in the process, um, you know, for me, watching Abby do this was almost like the experience I had when I made my first HF contact and participated in my own, con uh, my own first contest. So this is a great way, I think, that you can, a uh, simple thing that you can do that will engage new hams and young people in amateur radio. Um, we've also had a lot of success in schools. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Everything from simple stuff like participating in, in pie nights, which are like many science fairs that many schools do around STEM topics, doing an amateur radio display there. A lot of schools have STEM clubs or career days that they'll they easily to uh, generate an invite and become part of. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been personally involved in and I'm a huge advocate for is the ARIS program, something that the ARL also supports, um, which is it helps schools basically work with um, a, a group of folks and NASA to have the school make a contact with an astronaut on the International Space Station um, using amateur radio. And I can tell you, I, I, I'm acting as a mentor and a ground station as part of the ARIS program. The amount of interest in amateur radio and energy that results after you do one of these things is just unbelievable. Um, if you, uh, your group makes the investment to work with a local school to do an ARIS contact like this, you'll have all kinds of opportunities to license kids, license teachers, do follow on activities, start radio clubs. Um, you know, this is a pretty big project to go through this. Um, but uh, if you do that, you'll be well rewarded with a, with a seat at the table in just about any school that you invest in to do it. We've also done high altitude balloon projects carrying amateur radio. Um, we've been pretty successful in, in having people uh, donate money to fund all these projects. Um, they kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, teachers, parents, and of course, club members instantly see the value in doing this sort of stuff and they want to help. Okay. Another program that we've done um, pretty successfully is something called Ham Boot Camp. Um, we created this program by tracking um, Ham's progress to getting on the air and becoming active as a result of our licensing effort. I've also triangulated this with people like Gordon West, who's very active in licensing, as well as folks down in Newington at the league. Unfortunately, without um, a focus on mentoring, probably less than 25% of the individuals who are in a technician class license will be active and on the air a year later. We created this program specifically to attack that problem without a whole lot of resources. We simply um, got a group of people together in our club to teach about how and, and do hands-on demonstrations with, with people on how to get on the air, how to build a station, how to make contacts, how to put up an antenna, all the simple stuff that gets in the way of that new ham or recently upgraded ham in the case of general, um, 
of getting on the air and having fun with amateur radio. Another simple activity, and you all live in some great places to do this, is to create a focus on portable activities. You know, the ARL did a program called National Parks on the Air that I think drew a lot of good attention to this a few years back um, and generated a tremendous amount of activity around portable operating. Um, these things are relatively easy to put together. They're great chances for a group of hams to go somewhere, set up a portable station, share equipment, have fun. And, uh, you know, fox hunts are another good activity, um, as well as, you know, lots of other things that I'm sure many of you are already doing. And finally, I would probably be remiss if I didn't mention that this weekend is one of the best mentoring and, and, and opportunities to introduce new hams um, to amateur radio that there is. It's ARL Field Day. Um, we took a track. Um, from the very beginning of the sort of reinvention of our group to say that field day should be a learning experience. Um, and uh, a lot of our most experienced people work really hard to make a great experience for new people, new hams, and less experienced operators around field day. We also put a big focus on new technology as a way to showcase what amateur radio can do. We always have computer controlled satellite stations. Many times we have software defined radios. We put up data networks. We've generated uh, 70 centimeter video transmissions point to point from our field days, all in an effort to put the very best face that we can to the general public on how truly high tech a uh, hobby that amateur radio really is and the kinds of learning activities it can provide for people and motivation to pursue you know, engineering and scientific careers and, and technical careers in general. If you do this, and particularly if you put that focusing on mentoring, you will find that uh, parents, teachers, um, and particularly the news media will really begin to focus on what amateur radio is in a much more positive light. And I have an example of that here. Um, this is a, a news coverage from one of our field days. And I, I, I like you to just sort of demonstrate this through the press's eyes. Let's try that again. While well, practicing for a possible emergency. Next in six, how these amateur radio operators are getting ready for any disaster. Amateur radio operators across the country and Canada set up radio equipment this weekend for an event called Field Day. And while it is a contest, it's also a chance for operators to practice their emergency response capabilities so they're ready to provide communications if a disaster strikes. Dozens took part at Hudson Memorial School working completely off the grid, simulating a real emergency. What we've taught some of the kids in the school here about is how you actually track and, and talk and do communications through a satellite in space. One of the main things we like to do is uh, really further the education of uh, STEM uh, curriculum in local schools. This has been a partnership with the Hudson Middle School. Tango, radio tango. Trained some as young as 12 years old. That is incredible. Good for them. And they actually started setting up yesterday. They went 24 hours. So in that kind of unsettled weather that we had, they were still going. So wow. pretty impressive. Good for them. That's Might awesome. be a little wet down there. So that's regional television coverage for the New Hampshire and the and the eastern Massachusetts area. I'm not sure how many people saw that. It was the six o'clock news contest, our, our spot on uh, the Sunday evening of one of our field days. But I think you can see that if you focus on um, mentoring, STEM learning, all of the positive things that amateur radio can bring to um, learning, to emergency preparedness and so on, that you can actually put yourself and amateur radio in a very, very positive light in a very grassroots way. And I, I really believe that if we can get enough clubs and groups doing this across um, the United States through the ARL and, and, and regional organizations that are built around it, that we can create some tremendous positive impact for amateur radio. So at any rate, I hope, uh, I hope that uh, was helpful and interesting, and uh, I'll take any questions. It was very good, Fred. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, either raise your hand or unmute uh, and uh, go ahead and fr ask Fred. Hi, Fred. Yes. Um, Hello. Michael from Los Angeles. Uh, hey, first, Michael. Hi. Do you do the complete five transmitter hunt with uh, one minute on, four minutes off? 
And second, do you also do Jamboree on the air? You know, we, we've done a whole bunch of different activities. We did a Jamboree on the air with a local scout group um, a, a few years back. Um, so we've definitely supported that activity. That can be a great thing to do. We went out and built them a station, um, put up uh, put up a good antenna, but actually brought a small amplifier with generators in there, and the scouts just had an absolute ball. As far as fox hunting goes, we typically will put out um, at, at a school um, two or three transmitters. I've done many um, sort of hands-on activities as part of our high altitude balloon program where we teach in classes and, and some amateur radio electives that we're teaching and so on. Where after the class is out, we'll get the teachers to give the kids an hour. We'll go out in the school ground, we'll hide two or three foxes. We'll give the kids HTs and we'll let them track them down and have some fun with amateur radio as well as you know, you know, do the learning part. As far as field days go, um, we do anywhere from, well, I guess we're gonna do a, um, a four alpha plus a satellite station field day. Our biggest field days um, when we could be in tents and stuff safely, we typically do a 13, 14 alpha field day with four or five towers. So we're very much into that kind of activities. You know, I, I don't know that we're necessarily wed to any one specific youth program. We kind of look for all the opportunities that we can find to engage young people in schools or in scouts through JOTA um, and some of the other activities. I've been at YMCA's for demonstration days where, you know, we've taken a group of, of young people who maybe are a bit underprivileged and uh, we've made an amateur radio experience for them. It, it's more about, I think, just being committed to young people and, and having the word out there that you're willing to work on those issues and provide a quality experience. Once you do that, your, your problem will simply be not having enough hours in the day and people who don't work to go to all the places that you're welcome. Go ahead, Other Mike. questions, or, or maybe you have some programs or ideas that you think are pretty effective and uh, would like to share. Larry has his hand up. Larry, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I was wondering how do you handle um, kids that are, how can we say, uh, financially challenged? Because uh, I know a lot of kids that would like to be doing this, but uh, because of circumstances beyond their control and other people's, uh, they can't go out and afford even a bow thing. So yeah, how do you great. handle those? Great question. So a couple things we do there. So uh, I'm not, I think I mentioned this, our, our radio club is a 501c3 nonprofit. We did that in, in the spirit of, of grassroots and doing things with limited resources. We did that ourselves. Um, and uh, we, we raise about $15,000 a year through a variety of sources that we dedicate to this stuff. If a young person or their teacher comes to us and wants to get licensed, we make that totally free. Um, we give them the books. We take care of all the fees to, you know, cover the, the classes and stuff that we do. The only thing that they're involved in is the, the FCC license exam fee, and we'll even waive that for somebody who's needy. Um, one of the things we do in our licensing is we provide um, a raffle gift, and uh, one of those for a technician is usually a Baofang radio with a decent antenna. Um, again, when a, when a group of young people that um, want to get licensed, you know, middle school or high school group, we make that totally free. So, and then beyond that, our club is built to provide all kinds of activities. Our field days are examples of this. Um, we constantly do, um, you know, starter contests and so on for member stations. We try to take the resourcing problem away as much as we can and get people active. You know, I probably put up a dozen antennas for young people. I just did one um, right at the beginning of the, of the year last year where a young person really wanted to get a radio. His parents worked like crazy and he worked actually to save up the money for it. We went in there, put his antenna up for him, got him on the air, lent him a computer and some equipment to finish his station out. And we got him going. And, you know, again, grassroots activity from hams on these problems is really the key to success, I think. And it's not so much the money, it's the willingness to provide the mentoring and help people figure this out and have a good experience. 
Um, and you know, when parents see that a young person is really getting motivated to learn um, about STEM or electronics or, or that kind of stuff, sometimes that they'll, they'll work hard if they can do it to find the resources. And when they can't, if you have a vibrant community of, of amateur radio operators who are committed to this stuff, those people will find the resources for the people that need them. Um, I, I really think hams are very, very generous people when it comes to bringing new people into the hobby. Um, and, uh, you know, for us raising money to provide, you know, a lot of these programs that I talked about and a lot of others that I didn't have time to talk about has not been a problem at all. Fred, do you have uh, one person that acts as the contact point for the schools? Do you have uh, like a, a, an education person in your club or how does that, how do you handle that aspect of things? Um, it, it's not necessarily one person. We have a couple, three teachers who we've helped two in particular right now that are very committed to amateur radio in two schools. Um, we have a partner school. I'll just tell you a little story here. If you invest in schools and how good this can get at the beginning of this last school year, there's a local private middle school. And the principal called me and said, you know, we've had so many good experiences with your group. Would you come in and teach an amateur radio class to our sixth, seventh and eighth graders for credit? And of course, it took about five milliseconds for us to sign up to do that. That's a tremendous opportunity. We started out with a two hour class um, in the in the in the uh, fall semester. And it was so popular. They came back and said, could you create another one on different ones? Our kids want to go through some more of this. And so by the time it was all said and done in that particular school, we cycled about 150 of their students in grades six, seven, and eight through four hours of pretty high quality, hands-on oriented amateur radio stuff, everything from, you know, how wireless works, how the band plan looks, what it's like to make a, a sideband HF contact, satellites, digital communications, we introduced the kids to on the air SDRs that they could use to listen for free. So there's a good example of how you can break down some of the financial barriers a little bit. And so again, it's all about investing in building relationships and really showing your, I think that you're committed to mentoring and providing quality learning opportunities for people of all ages um, through amateur radio. And once you begin to do that, the response you're going to get in terms of members and people who want to get on board with you is, ju is just tremendous. You know, a, a lot of the reason that our club has grown at such a, a, a tremendous rate is because, you know, people have found out that we're committed to this and they want to be part of it. They want to take advantage of the mentoring. They want to learn. And many of them want to help. So, um, you know, I, I guess if there were one person who's that face to the schools, it would probably be me. I kind of consider as president of an organization that's dedicated to STEM learning and growing amateur radio, that I'm the right person to be that face. I think that's important. Other questions? You know, some of this stuff may seem a little daunting. I have to tell you that once we decided to try and make this a top priority, it really wasn't all that hard to do. Our biggest pro problem was that we had so many opportunities, it was difficult to, to absorb them all. Um, you know, at this stage, we could probably be in five or six local schools here if we had the people who had the time during the day to go and teach classes when kids are in school. That's probably our biggest limit. So, you know, I'd encourage you all to, to think about picking something out that might be fun. It doesn't have to be these programs. To pick some meaningful mentoring opportunity or training opportunity. And by the way, that doesn't have to be all focused on young people. Um, you know, our last ham boot camp that we did, which is about getting on the air, we had about 480 people register for this across the whole United States and even some outside the United States. 60% of those people had a general class license or higher. Think about that. What that means is there are a ton of people out there with pretty well-developed investments in amateur radio, a general ticket or better, that are looking for people to help them and mentor them. Imagine if each one of you took a little bit of time to focus on creating a, a, a mentoring opportunity. What might that do for participation in your contest club or your radio club or anything related to radio? Those people are all out there and they're looking for people 
who are committed to helping them have fun with amateur radio and, and learn how to do this stuff. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, hanging around. Uh, sure. Go, we'll I'd go love ahead to. We'll go Other class. To build on what you said about the emergency side as well. You know, one thing that, that I think is really positive about many young people today, especially not just folk necessarily school students alone, but people who are in the early years of their life, their 20s, their 30s, and that sort of range, is that there is a tremendous dedication to wanting to make a positive social distance difference for other people. And you know, if you can take that story around how amateur radio helps people in emergencies and helps deal with some of those situations, younger people really resonate and want to be part of that. Um, and uh, I think that that's probably uh, one of the unique opportunities that we all have to leverage that maybe hasn't achieved a lot of attention yet. But focusing on that desire for people who are maybe, let's say, under the age of 40, um, some of those folks really want to make a positive difference for the people around them, for their community and so on. And trying to fit amateur radio into that element um, through emergency preparedness, through education and all the other things we've been talking about is really pretty powerful stuff. And something that, again, I think that's another wonderful opportunity for a grassroots effort on the part of amateur radio operators. You know, a lot of this is gonna be about painting amateur radio in a modern, positive public light. We seem to be losing on that front in some important areas. And I think once, if we lose that battle, then our ability to get public support for spectrum and all the things that we want to do is going to be seriously impaired. And so probably beyond just some of the mentoring and stuff that are focused on the people that want to get in are already in. I think the other major area that's critical that relates to this stuff is how do we change the public's perception of amateur radio as an important and valuable thing to do and to support. I think there are lots of ways we can do that. Absolutely. How do you overcome the security problems? For example, in Florida, we're fairly close to Parkland. All of the schools are essentially, even though they're in session, they're locked down. You can't get onto the campus unless you have a top secret military security clearance beforehand and let them know that you're coming. They don't want ham radio people coming into their classrooms to teach ham radio stuff. And it's a big problem. How would you overcome that? Don, you want to take it or you want me to take a swing at that one? Uh, well, for, for, those of, for those of us that have done uh, secure work for, for a while, um, you understand why, um, why that is the way it is. Mm -hmm. yep. And on a, mus, on a much less uh, tense sense, you know, metal detectors in schools and, and uh, pre-authorization to show up even in the absence of a federal security guidelines, such as school guidelines about who comes on campus. Um, I think it's just, just uh, it's all overcomable by um, coordination and communication. That stuff is in place not to prevent students from having a thrilling, um, you know, enriching day, but it's just there to keep everybody safe. And uh, while that happens, and I think we can work with, we can work within those, uh, those restrictions. Yep, yep. yep. Just a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, again, your relationship with a teacher or a school administrator is the key to all of this stuff. Um, don't be uh, unwilling or, or hesitant to submit to a background check if you're asked. Um, some schools make that standard procedure. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's should be no hesitancy, I think, on the part of, of you or anyone that wants to be involved in this stuff to do that. Folks will judge you by your actions. If you work in the limited opportunities you're given initially to really focus on providing a quality experience for the students, their parents, the teachers, and the administrators are going to pick up on that real quickly. These are folks who know how to read people probably better than average. And if you're truly committed, you're, you're, and one of the things I always do when I go into school, I always spend some time and talk to a teacher or a principal or whatever afterwards say, how do we do? You know, how can we do this better? How do we, your students wanna learn? 
what should we be done in the demonstrations that you saw that would have made this more effective? If you really demonstrate that your commitment to becoming a quality part of the education process, the schools will welcome you. you know, the story I told you about a principal calling us up and inviting us in to teach in a COVID situation is a great example where you can get to if you really, really focus on a quality education experience first and amateur radio is a tool to do that. Some folks, I think, make the mistake, they get it reversed. They think they're there to push amateur radio. What you really have to do to be successful is go with the mindset that you're there to provide quality education and inspire students to do something great with their lives. And you know, a lot of us have probably had amateur radio make something great happen in our lives. So it's great that, that you, know, you as an evangelist have the ability to be a living you know, example of how that can happen. But you really need to be focused on what that group is about. And that's about a quality education experience for their students first. As long as you stay grounded in that and you work at it and you build those relationships, you're, I think your chances of success are excellent. Fred, I think that's an excellent thing. That's one of the things I always try and uh, stress when I'm working with schools is to meet their curricular needs in addition to whatever my goals might be and quite often that means having things that are not really amateur r related directly but are uh, intersect with them so for example when we did a presentation recently we had two tracks the students could choose to do different things one of them included writing t uh, radio advertisements so tied in with the language cool. arts um, but we also do things you know in, in all the different subject areas so that the teachers feel like they're they're being supported in their curricular goals. That's a really good one. You know, if you're, you're in the classroom, you spend some time with the science and math teachers that are there and ask them, what are you teaching right now? And see if you can't creatively enforce that. You know, one thing that, um, that we did, I, I had a little bit of this on my charts is the high altitude balloon project. And actually one middle school gives us about 12 total hours of their classroom time to teach a STEM curriculum. And we started out, you know, we covered things like buoyancy and, uh, you know, gravity laws and jet stream weather. And we found out that they were also teaching similar topics to the kids in science and math classes. And so we kind of lined it up. And after we did it a couple of times, a couple of the teachers got licensed and we turned the teaching of that amateur radio stuff over to the teachers and sat in the classroom and backed them up while they did it. And so again, if you, you, the point you're making is excellent. If you really focus on providing a valuable extension to what the school is already trying to teach, you will find that the, 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 those teachers and the administrators of the school will eventually welcome you in to be a part because you're the part that's making all the abstract content uh, stuff real for the students and giving them a chance to have some fun with it in the process. And boy, that really strengthens the whole learning experience a lot. I got a question as a, as a guy that's new to the hobby. I'm in a classroom and I've got Echo Link on my cell phone and I want the, the kids to have a chance to say they're monitoring our local repeater or I've pre-staged somebody there. What's the protocol for me handing the phone to some 11-year-old? Um, what does he have to say to operate under my guidance and adhere to whatever the parameters are of that use of an echo link? Yeah, so Don, I'll take that one. I've had a lot of experience with doing this stuff. You have to serve as a proper control operator. So you need to be sure that folks that are listening to you on the air understand that your call sign is being used, that you're managing the communication, that you're following all the rules for ID, and third party traffic and all the stuff that, you know, we all know how to properly do as amateur radio operators. Beyond that, it's very important that you engage another amateur who is, understands what's going on and is wanting to be part of the experience. And, you know, I've, I've done sort of random DX contacts as well as repeater contacts that have been completely on stage. Man, I must've done 50 of them or more in classrooms. And I have never encountered a situation where the amateur radio operator at the other end wasn't, once they understood what was happening, wasn't willing to provide a quality experience because everybody knows worldwide how important it is to engage young people. And when they find themselves in an opportunity to do that, sometimes a little hard to get somebody to stop talking. I've had that problem. Right. But uh, I've never had someone who wasn't willing to you know, explain their station 
um, tell us about where you live. Um, tell us about how amateur radio you got involved. You know, the kinds of things that a young person or a new ham for that matter, young or old, would really relate to because they're going through the same experience that that person did. And there's something electric about hearing a kid's voice on the radio. Oh, yeah. It's just a unique thrill. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Other questions for Donner or for me? Yeah, you know, Steve, you made a great comment. It's great that the kids learn the responsibility that it's not a toy. You know, uh, that's a really good one. And one of the things that we always do start out with when we talk to young people is say, you know, amateur radio operators are some of the most accomplished operators in the world. Many of us can sit, you know, in front of a microphone or a key or, or a computer in, in a pile up environment with the expeditions or the contest or especially but whatever it is make thousands of contacts and not make hardly a mistake there's almost no one that's in the radio service anywhere that has those kinds of skills and you know to the extent that you could kind of impress on this that hey you know in addition to this being a really fun thing to do this is a chance to learn some really important skills learn to communicate which by the way with a heavy emphasis on social media a lot of kids and their parents would love to have their kids have a little bit more direct social interactive skills. And the fact that you can pick a microphone up and meet somebody that you have something in common with, you know, a third of the way around the world and have a great conversation and learn about where they live and all that kind of stuff. That's really powerful stuff. Right. And, you know, the more we can get parents, teachers, students, and for importantly, the general public to understand that, the better stead we're going to put amateur radio in, I think. But we need some smarty pants to fuse digital radio with TikTok. Mm -hmm. And then I think we'd be cooking with gas. Well, you know, one thing that you can do if you do a special event or, or you know, you have that go to activity where you have your hams in your station, fire up a Facebook camera and live stream that. If you go to the National Radio Society's Facebook page, you will find some of our young operators that have done that as part of our station, they have thousands and thousands of hits on those videos. Um, now you don't wanna break rules in a contest where you know people are get, getting information through that. You have to be a little careful of what you do there. But if it's an informal operating activity, that's a wonderful way to ev evangelize how much fun amateur radio can be. And by the way, the kids will absolutely eat that up. They'll go tell their friends back at school, hey, check out this Facebook thing. I was on the radio and talking to people all over the world this weekend. Look at all the people I talked to. And how about this person that was driving in a car in Sicily that was just thrilled to be talking to me and all that kind of stuff. You know, fusing amateur radio in with the kinds of stuff that modern culture relates to can also be very, very powerful. And yep, you know, Don, you made this point that there's some skills that we got to learn on how to master the technology to do that. But I got to tell you, man, it was a hell of a lot harder for me to build an HF station, get an antenna to work right, than it was to learn how to stream video to Facebook. That, that, that was actually a pretty, and you know, we're, we're a learning group of people, we amateur radio operators. It's not hard for us to learn. We just have to decide to do it. Right. Well said. Um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, if you were giving advice to a club that's not very active or having issues, uh, not just sort of stuck. What would be some of your key points that you would suggest to a club that needs to refresh itself? Yeah, I, I, I guess I have a little different philosophy. And, you know, I can really relate to the question because we were a train wreck not six years ago. I mean, we literally were on right of the verge of one of the oldest clubs in New England of going out of existence. Um, I have one additional chart here I'd like to share with you. And this is pretty much the path that we used to develop all of our programs. It, it, for those of you who have been in startups, you'll, you'll probably know about a concept of learning to fail fast. So when you work in a brand new startup, you're trying to create a new thing. Nobody knows how to do that. It's, it's a mystery, it's an enigma. And the way successful people in startups learn this is they fail. And they learn from their failures, they pick up the pieces, and they try again quickly. That's what failing fast is all about. So um, what I would say is pick one thing, probably focused around mentoring or people who 
um, are not well grounded in the hobby yet because there are a million of them out there looking for clubs and people who will help them and then say, okay, I'm going to focus on that. And we're going to try something. Now here's how we developed our youth programs. And it's an example of what this failing fast thing is about in a six month period, myself and two other hams in our club got together and said, you know what, we're going to figure this youth thing out. This is what we want to do because we know we can make a difference here. We did a youth activities day. Three kids showed up. We did youth on the air. We got six kids. We did a go to station at, at soccer practice, and we were the only ones operating. We did a ham radio day at a local maker organization. There we got some traction. A lot of the parents that were involved with some of the younger people there were there. A lot of them got on the air with us, and we got some follow on. And most importantly, we met a teacher there who said, you know, this is pretty good stuff. Why don't you come to a career day at our school, which is what you see me doing up there, where we took an amateur radio station in there and, and set it up and put all those kids on the air as part of a career day. Um, we started getting involved in the rookie roundup and, and, and some special event operating. We started to get traction. A school invited us in to participate with a five class series of their STEM club. And that's where we created the idea to launch a balloon. And so what we did is we found two or three people, not a big army, not a lot of money that were committed to going through the process to find something that worked. We got feedback every place we went, we learned, and more importantly, we demonstrated that we were really committed to providing real STEM learning through amateur radio to enough people that eventually people noticed us and opened the door. The other thing I would say about geography is that it is a big disadvantage, but in this day and age, it's not fatal. You know, our club grew over a hundred members during the COVID interval, and almost all of them were outside of our area, okay? So how do we do that? We took a quality mentoring experience, we put it online and we promoted it. And we made it modern and we constantly got feedback every step of the way of what was working for people and what was it? The folks down in Newington, without really much commitment of resources, jumped on and they helped us promote it. The last time we did this, we had 480 people sign up to be mentored. And a lot of those folks are joining the National Area Radio Society as a result because they want more. They see we're committed to this stuff. So just find one or two other people. You know, Dom, what you did to start some of your activities by yourself, way to go, brother. Um, you don't need an army to make a change. And you know what's going to happen when you start to be successful, when those two, you and your two friends who are trying to change things, get some traction. The other people in your group are going to want to be part of that. Not everybody, but enough people will help you that you'll get some momentum. The grassroots effect, because so many of us know that it, we have to find a way to engage new people and build the amateur radio hobby and the public's perception of it up. There's a lot more people out there that are willing to help if they can see that you're getting traction. And this is one way that you can find out how to get traction. Don't get stuck. You're going to fail. Don't be discouraged. Get feedback. Understand what happened. Be critical of what you did right. And, and more importantly, what you did wrong. Fix the stuff you did wrong. And eventually you're going to find some tremendous programs that are going to work for you. It's not that hard. It does take some work, but it's not that hard to be successful. It's really not. Fred, I think that's just wonderful advice. Do we have any other questions? Well, I would like to thank both of you for taking your time out to uh, present this evening. It's been great. I got a lot of good ideas from both of you that I uh, Oscar, can't wait Oscar to try. Oscar has his hand up, Anthony. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who has their hand up? Oscar? No, no, no. I don't think. Oh. There you go, Oscar. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank both of you. I, I have some good ideas from both of you that I can't wait to try out with our local group. And uh, this, uh, this will be recorded and available uh, online for people. And if there's no other questions, I'll pause again for questions here. Thank you both for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been a, uh, a great opportunity. And if you'll give me just one second, um, I want to throw up in the chat the link to uh, our digital um, playgroup.
So. And Dom, while you're doing that, I just want to say that, you know, we're all in here on helping clubs anywhere um, to sort some of this stuff out. We've got a lot of additional material on, you know, the details of how we rebuild our club. If I can help any of your clubs in that kind of environment, you know, over Zoom or some other way, I'm more than happy to spend my energies doing that. You know, we were also rewarded and we were surprised to become club of the year. And one of the things we decided as a group when we had that awesome recognition was that we were going to devote as much energy as we could to helping other clubs. You know, I want to be, the only thing I ask is that when you're club of the year, that maybe you invite me to your dinner because <laughs> I want to, I want to be there. I want to be there to, to celebrate your good work. You can make a huge difference. All you have to do is decide you're going to do it. Well, thank you both. And uh, thank you, Barry, for putting this together this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.